I'm Jill Morricone. We're so glad when you tune in to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We love opening up the Word of God. We love sharing with you at home, our 3ABN family. We have loved this quarter, written by Elder Mark Finley, on the three cosmic messages, the three angels' messages. This lesson, we're just launching in to the third angel. We spent quite a bit of time on the first angel's message and a few weeks on the second angel's message, and we're just beginning to dip our toes in, you could say, into the third angel's message. This is the Seal of God and the Mark of the Beast, part one, and we'll really get into the meat of the matter next week with part two. On the panel is my brothers in Christ, Pastor James Rafferty, glad to have you. Good to be here, Jill. I have Monday's lesson, which is the cosmic struggle. In the middle, Pastor John Denzi, wonderful to have you too. It's a blessing to be here again, and I have Tuesday, Reaping What We Sow. Wow, that sounds good. Evangelist and singer in Israel, Ryan Day, glad you're here. Amen. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled, Those Who Follow the Lamb. Mm. Last but not least, Professor Daniel Perrin, so glad you're here as well. Thank you. I have Thursday's lesson, which is about Jesus, our only mediator. Oh, sounds wonderful. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor James, would you pray for us? Yes. Father, again, we just want to thank you for this beautiful message that you have given to us in these last days to help us to get our focus on Christ and the everlasting gospel. And we pray as we continue to close this up, these last few lessons that we have for this quarter, that your spirit will continue to guide us and teach us, to instruct us, to be with each one of the viewers, to guide their hearts to heaven. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Elder Finley brings out in Sabbath's portion of the lesson, I love this, wanted to start with it before we go to our memory text. The central issues in the great controversy between Christ and Satan are authority, worship, and loyalty. Mm. From the very beginning, Satan wanted the authority, the worship, and the loyalty that belong to God alone. Think of Isaiah chapter 14. What does it say? Satan, Lucifer, wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted the authority that belonged to God. He wanted the loyalty of the angels that belonged to God. He wanted the worship that belonged to God. We see in the Garden of Eden, Eve wanting the authority that belonged to God. She wanted to be like God. God. Mm. We see in the Roman Catholic Church and apostate Protestantism, the harlot system, we see this counterfeit system that it seeks to usurp God's authority. We see the little horn of Daniel 7, we've referenced this before, that seeks to change times and laws, seeking the authority that belongs to God alone. We see this in the sea beast of Revelation chapter 13, the same power. We see that it's given authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation. We see that this power seeks to command loyalty and it introduces a counterfeit system of worship. Satan's counterfeit system, the authority, he seeks to usurp it from God. It doesn't belong to him, but he tries to steal it from God. We see in Satan's counterfeit system that he compels worship. Mm. Worship is forced. Worship is coerced. We'll study as we get into this in Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. We see worship being involved with coercion or force. If you don't worship, you're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. We see that loyalty is obtained through fear or force. By contrast, God's system, authority belongs naturally to God because he is divine, because he is pre-existent, because he is our creator and our redeemer. We see that worship is not compelled. Worship to God is not forced. It is invited by love. 1 John 4, 19, we love him, why? Because he first loved us. We see in Romans 5, 8, God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet still, even now sinners, Christ died for us. We see in Christ's system that loyalty is through love. 
You see, love begets love. Love begets loyalty. And love begets obedience. There's a quote from the lesson. I love this. This is Elder Finley. There is only one thing that will keep any of us from receiving the mark of the beast in the end time. That is a love for Jesus so deep that nothing will break our hold on him. I think that's so important as we step into this topic, we can think sometimes the mark of the beast is scary. Mm -hmm. Well, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm not sure I even understand that. I even remember my grandmother, she's passed away now, awaiting the call of the life giver. But I remember for years when I was growing up, she was terrified of the last days, mm. terrified of uh, the mark of the beast. Would she be strong enough? And would she be able to withstand torture or persecution? It was a scary thing for her. And I think if we keep in mind that it's about love mm -hmm. and if we have love for Jesus strong enough, nothing will break our hold on him. And we can walk into those end times without fear because we walk with Jesus. Our memory text is Revelation 7, verses two and three. Revelation 7, two and three. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. On Sunday's lesson, we look at steadfast endurance, and we're going to Revelation 14, verse 12. We're going to look at characteristics of God's end time people. Now, we've quoted this verse many times, but we're going to quote it again. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, when you read that many times, what do we think? What are the characteristics of God's end time people? We say they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Do we not? Those are the two characteristics. But the lesson brings out that there's three characteristics mm. of God's end time people. And the first characteristic we always just rush over. Mm. Here is the patience of the saints. Wow. That's the first characteristic. Mm -hmm. God's end time people possess patience. What does that mean? In the Greek, it's steadfast endurance. Yes. It's endurance in the context of suffering. God's end time people will possess steadfast endurance. God's end time people will keep the commandments of God. God's end time people will possess the faith of Jesus. So let's look at those three characteristics. We're going to start with the steadfast endurance of God's end time people. The word in Greek means remaining under, you know, kind of like when you're going through a difficult trial and you have to <gasps> remain under that trial and you're under that. It's the same word used in Hebrews 10, verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Mm -hmm. The patience of the saints endures until they receive the promise. Mm -hmm. It's the same word found in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with endurance mm -hmm. or with patience the race that is set before us. The patience of the saints runs the race, no matter how long, no matter how difficult. It's the same word used in James chapter 1, verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or steadfast endurance. The patience of the saints grows through trial. What have God's end time people endured? They've endured the wrath of the, wrath of the beast power the economic sanctions. We'll discuss in further detail of Revelation chapter 13. They've endured persecution. They've endured ridicule. They might endure torture mm. or even death. How do we endure? I want to give you three ways that we can endure. Number one, pray for faith. I think of the man with the demon-possessed son. Remember, he came to Jesus and, please help, help, help cast out the demon. And, and what he said, I don't have enough faith. I don't have enough faith. I don't know what I'm going to do. And what did he say? Lord, I believe. Mm -hmm. Help my 
unbelief? Are you going through a time where you need steadfast endurance? Are you going through a time of trial and trouble? Reach out to God. You can pray for faith. God, help my unbelief. Give me faith to endure. Number two, pray for courage. I think of Joshua when he began leading the children of Israel. Joshua 1, 9, have not I commanded you, be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Number three, pray for an eternal perspective. Sometimes I get so lost in what's here. You don't see the forest for the trees. You know, you just see what's right in front of you and you don't see that eternal perspective. That is the first characteristic of God's end time people is those who have steadfast endurance, those who possess the patience of the saints. We're gonna look very quickly at the other two characteristics. God's end time people keep the commandments of God. They will not believe that the law was nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. They will not uphold the traditions of any church over the word of God. They will not believe that grace gives them a license to sin. God's end time people will keep all of God's commandments, including the fourth commandment. They will believe that the seventh day Sabbath was instituted at creation, installed in the very heart of the 10 commandments, kept by Jesus and his apostles, yes, even after the cross, and will be kept in the new heavens and the new earth. They believe that God's law is still binding. They understand that the commandments of God can be kept only by grace through faith. The final characteristic, which Pastor James is going to cover very fully, is they possess, God's end time people will possess the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What is Jesus' faith? His faith endured hunger and temptation, Matthew chapter 4. His faith endured ridicule, John 6, when the people turned away and walked no more with him. Mm -hmm. His faith endured the betrayal of his friends, Judas, when he betrayed him with a kiss. Mm -hmm. His faith endured separation from his father when he hung on the cross and said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. His faith endured pain and torture and death because he loved you and me. He loved us enough to go to the cross. His faith looked beyond the here and now and looked into eternity. If you want to be part of God's end time people, ask God for his steadfast endurance. Seek to keep and obey by the power of his grace alone, his commandments, and ask him to give you the faith of Jesus. Amen, amen. Amen. That was a great introduction, Jill. It's always easy to follow you. We're going to be looking at in more detail this faith of Jesus. The lesson quarterly calls this uh, today's lesson the cosmic struggle, and it is the cosmic struggle to have this faith of Jesus. And you know, the faith of Jesus was the faith that he had in his father that took him through everything. The verses that we're reading here, we're not going to read them actually, but I'm going to give you the references are Matthew chapter 27, 45 to 50. Basically what we see here is Christ on the cross being forsaken of God and yet holding on, committing his soul, his spirit into the hands of God. And I'd like to suggest that Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, points to a people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Here's the patience of the saints who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The reason they keep the commandments of God is because they love God. And the reason why they love God is because God first loved them. And that is a formula, a scriptural, biblical, gospel formula that is the key to obedience to God's commandments. Well, there's another formula with the faith of Jesus. The reason why we're going to put our faith in Jesus, the reason why we're going to hold on to everything, the reason why we're going to be able to endure everything that comes against us and maintain our faith in Jesus is because we're going to realize His faith in us. His faith in us is going to give us faith in Him. You see, He's the author and the finisher of our faith, we're told in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. And He gives to everyone a measure of faith, we're told in Romans chapter 14 and verse 23. Maybe it's 21. You have to look that one up. So there's this powerful statement, and it's it's found in uh, the book 
Christ triumphant. It's also found in the book, The Desire of Ages. And in tri Christ triumphant, it's, it's, it's quoted in the quarterly here. And here's how, what it reads. It says, amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, mm -hmm. Christ had drained the last dregs of the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, are you ready? Here's the faith of Jesus. In those dreadful hours, he relied upon the evidences Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He relied upon the evidences of his father's acceptance hitherto forgiven him. Mm -hmm. By faith, Christ was victor. Yeah. In other words, right then and there, there was no evidence. But he relied upon the evidence that God had already given him. Right, amen. Okay, let's follow this because this is a powerful theme. We think about the faith of Jesus. The evidences of God's love hitherto forgiven. If you read, now we're just talking about us now. We're moving to the human. If you read just the Gospel of John, you're going to find that God gives us evidences of his love. For example, in John chapter 1, verse 9, God tells us that Jesus Christ is the light who lights every man that comes into the world. Every human being that is born, God sends a ray of light. Okay, someone else will be born, send a ray of light. Someone else will be born, another ray of light over here. Someone else will be born, here's another ray of light. Rays of light just coming from heaven to all these. God gives light to every, because God has faith that he's exercising toward us. He believes, the reason he sent us light, he believes that we'll respond to that light. He hopes that we'll respond to that light. He holds out for us to respond to that light because love, hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the most precious verse of the Bible, we're told that God so loved the world, not Christians only, not Baptists only, not Seventh-day Adventists only, not vegan Seventh-day Adventists only. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, God is exercising faith. Why is he loving the whole world? Because he's holding out. He's believing that whosoever believes, whosoever, there might be somebody down there. Maybe there's a lot of bodies down there who are going to believe. God is exercising faith in giving his son. God is exercising faith toward us in giving us this light. In John 6, 37, Jesus says, Whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Yes. He believes in you. And, and if you will come to him, he's not going to cast you out. In John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, there's this beautiful story of this woman that is caught in adultery. Now, that doesn't sound like a beautiful story, but the way it ends up, it's really beautiful because the religious leaders, the Pharisees of the day, are wanting to bring her before Jesus and just get her condemned and get her stoned and have a reason to accuse Jesus before the Romans and just take him out, just take his ministry out. And Jesus you know, the Holy Spirit rested upon him in sevenfold power. That's what we're told in Isaiah chapter 11, 1 and 2. And so Jesus knew what was going on there. He discerned the whole situation. And as they asked him, you know, Moses said she should be stoned. What do you say? He began to write in the sand, the finger of God, just like he wrote on the 10, uh, the, the the tablets of the law, those Ten Commandments with his own finger, Jesus again, God himself writing in the sand. And you can imagine as he's writing there, we don't know exactly what he wrote, but each one of those accusers left from the youngest to the, or the oldest to the, they left, right, the situation. There was no one left. And Jesus asked the question of the woman, is there no one here to condemn you? And she kind of timidly said, uh, no man, Lord, because, you know, Jesus was still there and he could have easily condemned her. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more or leave your life of sin. See, the gospel empowers obedience. The gospel, mm -hmm. grace, non-condemning grace, empowers us to leave our life of sin. This is the gospel again. This is the faith of Jesus toward this woman. Jesus believes that when he preaches the gospel to this woman, she's going to leave her life of sin. He doesn't know that, but he believes it by faith. He exercises faith in her. I'm not going to condemn you. I know you were just caught in the act of adultery, but I believe in you and I believe you're going to leave that, leave that life of sin. In John chapter 10, verse 10, we're told that the, the devil, Satan, the prince of this world, comes to kill and to steal and destroy. But Jesus comes and he has a different method. He's thinking, you know what? I don't think that's going to work. I'm going to come. I, I think I'm going to give. I'm going to give life. I'm going to come and I'm going to give life. I'm going to give abundant life to these people. I'm not just going to promise them eternal life. I'm going to start healing people. I'm going to go through whole towns and villages. I'm just going to heal everybody. Ten lepers, only one of them has a good motive. I'm going to heal them all because I'm going to exercise faith in this human right. being. I'm going to exercise faith in every human being. In John chapter 12, verse 32, we're told that Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up on the cross because I want to draw 
all unto me. Everyone is drawn to Jesus because Jesus is exercising faith toward everyone. In fact, after he was crucified, his disciples, you know, Judas, you mentioned Jill, Jesus had forsaken him, right? I mean, with a kiss, he betrayed him. And even the other disciples forsook him. And then we're told that, you know, Peter denied him, right? Mm -hmm. And after this is all over, Jesus is resurrected and the disciples are all despondent. They're discouraged and they're just, they're having one of those 3 ABN downer days, you know? I mean, it's just, nothing's going right, right? No, 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 no. And so they're out, they're out. We just clarified. They're out, they're going back to their whole, like, they're going back to their, the old school, right? We're going to go fishing, they're fishing. We're going to go fishing. So they're out there fishing, catching nothing. You know what, Jesus, what happens with Jesus? He shows up, cooks some breakfast blesses them with a catch that they can't even hardly hold in. You know why? He's exercising faith in them. That's right. He's exercising. And the disciples are, 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 are thinking about this. I mean, the faith of Jesus, really, it is the gospel. It is the gospel. We've got the gospel and the law summarized in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It's accepting what Jesus says about us when we don't see anything good in ourselves. It's believing that we are who he says we are. We are loved. We are enlightened. We are accepted. We are uncondemned. We are invited. We are blessed because that's what Jesus says. And that's what Jesus needed. You know, when he was baptized, God said to him, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he went out into the wilderness and his whole circumstance changed. Everything changed. He was bearing the weight of the sins of the world. He was abandoned, seemingly abandoned from, by God after those 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. And the devil came to him. You know what the devil said? Poof. If you're the son of God, you know, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Yeah. Right. And what did Jesus do? He said, it is written. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the words that proceeded out of the mouth of God were, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. See, faith comes by hearing Romans 10, 17 and hearing by the word of God. And so when we come to Jesus at our worst, he comes to us at his best. Yes. Jesus sees something in us that is placed there by faith. Jesus saw something that we didn't see, something in the human race that we didn't see. And so he exercised faith toward us. And this faith we are to keep. We're to keep the faith of Jesus. When we keep the faith of Jesus, just like when we keep the love of God, when we keep the faith of Jesus Christ, we exercise faith back to him. When we keep the love of God, we love him because he first loved us. We're going to have faith in Jesus because he first had faith in us. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I love that. The faith in Jesus. What a wonderful explanation. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We're going to turn it over to Pastor John Denzi. Thank you so much. We are now on Tuesday's portion, as you heard, and the title is Reaping What We Sow. Reaping What We Sow. And I'd like to begin by reading the first part here in the lesson. It says, the prophecy regarding the mark of the beast is about religious intolerance, an economic boycott, persecution, and eventually a death decree. But notice, he says, surprisingly, it is also a message of encouragement. Even in the worst of times, God will sustain his people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. And among those commandments, of course, is the fourth commandment, the seventh day, or the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, the commandment number four. So we encourage you to consider that this message is also an encouraging message because there is a group of faithful people who will face what Revelation 13 brings out while the majority of the people are going along with the plan, along with what this beast brings out, there's a group of people being faithful to God. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, and the dragon was 
wroth or enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring or the remnant who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And yes, as you've heard before, this is here a prophecy and a woman represents a church. This is a pure church. These are faithful people. And I ask you the question, why is the devil enraged or uh, has this wrath against this woman? And it's interesting the characteristics you see here. They have... They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So obviously the devil doesn't like for people to keep the commandments of God. Let's continue reading in Revelation chapter 14 now. We go to verses 9 through 12. This is the third angel's message. Let's read that to get some context because we're going to talk a little bit about Revelation chapter 13. It says in verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever received the mark of his name. Notice again, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Why is this verse 12 there in the midst of this description about uh, the wine of the wrath of God. And then it says that those who receive the mark in his forehand, look at verse 9 and look at verse 12, compare them because there is there a contrast being presented. Yeah. Those that receive the mark are following along with Satan's plan, mm -hmm. going along with the plan uh, of the false Sabbath that is presented by this beast. Uh, but there in contrast is Chapter verse 12 that says, here's the patience of the saints. Those are the faithful of the Lord are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is a very clear message. You know, we see it and we study it and we understand it as clear, but perhaps to some of you it's not clear. So we try to highlight these things for your benefit. But please consider this and study this because it is a message for us living today. I read to you from... The Great Controversy, which, uh, the Great Controversy, written by Ellen G. White, page 50. And this is a very uh, enlightening message. It says, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin, foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne of God, upon the throne of the earth, actually, it says here, according to his will. He wants to be in control. Mm -hmm. He wants worship. And that's why he's pushing this agenda and has been pushing it for many, many years. Mm -hmm. He wants worship. And there's this worship uh, in contrast to God's worship, he wants people to worship his way. Mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians chapter three, chapter two, uh, chapter two, actually verse three, it says, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Mm -hmm. What does he do? Verse four says, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is showing us that this is a religious political power, takes hold of the civil power, wants the, the support of the civil power, and this it forms the beast. It is against God. It is a masterpiece of Satan. And the idea that it's a religious type of system brings people the idea, oh, this is of the Lord. Look, they're using the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're using, they're quoting scripture, mm -hmm. but the doctrines are doctrines of error. Mm -hmm. Some mixture of truth, but 
it's error, and we need to beware of this uh, satanic delusion. Uh, from the lesson, it says, religious persecution, of course, is not new. It has been around ever since Cain killed Abel for worshiping the way God instructed them to worship. See Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Jesus said persecution would happen even to believers in the first century and down through the ages. And he says, uh, he, quoting here in the lesson, the time is coming. He warned that whoever kills you think, will think that he offers God service. Mm. So there's a group of people, even other religious systems, and this is the dangerous part, because they, they have a form of godliness, but they're following uh, Satan's way, disguised, with a religious garb that sounds uh, holy, just, and good, but it is a, it's a deception that is a masterpiece, and that's why it's so important to read and understand, study the three angels' messages. We praise the Lord that this is the topic of this quarterly. Uh, we bring to you the question presented in the Sabbath School lesson. What will God's end time people face in the final crisis? Now we move to Revelation 13. We're reading verse 15 uh, through 17. It says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Mm -hmm. Notice that this verse implies that this power is creating laws, regulations mm -hmm. for people to follow. He speaks and causes that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There, so there's going to be laws that say, if you don't worship this way, you will be killed. And notice verse 16, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, free and slave, accustomed to the King James Version, mm -hmm. to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. You're going to hear more about this in uh, next week's lesson, but we just uh, need to quote it here. And notice verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So these are the characteristics of the law that will come upon the land and the world mm -hmm. because he causes all, all, both small and great, rich and poor. And it's, it's, a, it's a time of uh, conflict. It is a time of test for the world. So what will you do? Will you be prepared to face this? Now, I know we can face this with fear, but we need to face it trusting in Jesus. And you're going to hear about that as we go along. And I believe it, the time has come. If, it's, if it has not come already, it's going to come soon that to preach a message of peace and safety will be a message from the devil. Uh, we can have peace and safety in Jesus, but to say we have peace and safety in society will be a false message. You see, this is about you will reap what you sow. And the lesson brings out that the devil is preparing professed Christians by compromises in their lives to receive the mark of the beast when the final test comes mm -hmm. upon us in the future. So people have made decisions that uh, are lining them up to take the mark of the beast. We need to stop and uh, take a look at our lives, take a look at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Are we identifying with God or are we identifying with the devil? Be very careful because he has a blending of truth and error. Let's stick with the truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Denzi, so much. Pastor James, Sister Dill, thank you so much for all that you guys have presented. My friends, we're going to be jumping into Revelation chapter 13. My name is Ryan Day, and we're going to be covering Wednesday's lesson entitled, Those Who Follow the Lamb. We're going to be looking at a contrasting view of these two major systems in the last days, in the, last days the two major groups, and each and every one of us have a choice. God does not force us. He does not bring about uh, enforcing His will on ours. It's our choice to decide which part of, of which group we decide we want to be a part of, which uh, ultimately in the last days, which person or which uh, ultimate power we're going to serve. So we're in Revelation chapter 13 
And I'm going to just begin in verse 1, and we're going to read through probably the first eight verses, and then we're going to bring some points about through this. So Revelation chapter 13, uh, I'm just going to read through it, and then we're going to backtrack and make some points. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 says, Then I stood up on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as it were, had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We read those verses because uh, we have studied in greatly already of this, this Babylon system, this mystery Babylon, the, the mother of harlots, mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots. And of course, what we find when we study Bible prophecy is that same little horn from Daniel chapter 7 and 8, this same system right here in Revelation chapter 13, the first beast, and of course, that harlot system of Revelation chapter 17. This is that great antichrist uh, Babylon system that is at war against God. God, that the devil himself is using uh, to bring war against God. There's just simply six clear identifications that I wanted to bring from this, just so we're clear on this, because we're talking about the, the seal of God, the mark of the beast, and many people have these crazy ideas about what the mark of the beast is, and they don't stop to really ask themselves what it is that they're studying or what it is that they're trying to identify and identifying the mark of the beast. Uh, first of all, you have to know who the beast is before you can identify who, uh, what that mark is, because it's the mark of the beast and not just any beast. It's the first beast of Revelation 13, which we just read about in those eight verses. Really quickly, six clear identifications, and I'm just going to make reference to the verses. You can go back and watch this again on 3AV and Plus or, or right there on YouTube to get a, uh, just to go back through and see these identifications and match them with the verses. But the very first identification we see is that this very first beast is, is coming up out of the sea. First of all, let's clarify what is a beast in, in Bible prophecy. According to Daniel chapter 7, we know that a beast represents a great empire a kingdom, a significant worldly power that is, in this case, dominating the world. And so in this case, we find that it's coming up out of the sea. We know the sea, according to Revelation 17, verse 15, represents a large mass populated area. So this beast is rising up among a large populated uh, region of the earth in which the people are seemingly giving it its power as it is rising up and it begins to dominate in a very mass populated area. And we see that in verse 1. Our second identification is that this is a black blasphemous power. We don't see this once, not twice, but three times in this same passage in verse 1, verse 5, and verse 6. God wants us to know this system's not of me. This is a blasphemous power. It's blaspheming my name. It's blaspheming my tabernacle. It's blaspheming what I represent. And we know that blasphemy, according to the Bible, is simply assuming as a created being, as men, when we assume the authority of God in the form of forgiving sins or just simply claiming to be God or going to persecute others in the name of God, thinking, I guess, Again, as, uh, as, as brought out clearly here that when people persecute you and think that they are doing right according to the name of God, that's a form of blasphemy. Paul brings that out very clearly. This is a blasphemous power. Third identification, we see that it would reign for a prophetic 42 months. And when we do the math there, clearly we see that it's, uh, it's a period of 1,260 years. And we see that clearly there in verse 5. Also in verse, uh, or excuse me, our fourth point is that this is a persecuting power. It persecutes God's saints. We see it in Daniel 7. We see it in Revelation 13. The harlot is drunken with the blood of the saints in Revelation 17. So right here in verse 7 of Revelation 13, it's a persecuting power. It's also given world dominion. This isn't some little mealy-neely little system on a street corner somewhere over in, you know, who knows where. This is a world-dominant power that has its hands in everything. It has, uh, as, as Revelation 17 brings out, it has special relationships with the leaders of the world. It's a very, very influential system. We see that in verse 3, verse 4, and verse 
verse 7 of Revelation chapter 13. And of course, the last identification, but not least, there's many more identifications, but just for the sake of time, our sixth identification is that it, we see that it receives a deadly wound and we know that deadly wound will be healed. Hasn't yet, but it's on its way there. But we see that its deadly wound is given according to verse 3. And if you look that up historically and you study it accordingly, that deadly wound was given none other than 1798, exactly at the close of that 1260 year period. My friends, there's only one power of earthly authority that can fit the biblical description, and it's none other than the Roman papal church state power. Now, we go through all of that to make this point, because if you look back at the, at the, at the point that's made here uh, in the, in the uh, lesson, it's asking who's behind this power. We, we see this power is just, I mean, it's got its hands in everything. It's influencing the world. But Revelation 13 verse 2 makes it clear that the dragon is behind this power. And who is the dragon? We need not wonder. We need not guess who this dragon is because the previous chapter, Revelation 12, as well as Revelation chapter 20 makes it very clear that this dragon is none other than the devil himself. And you might say, well, why doesn't the devil just come and do his work alone? Well, of course the devil wants worship, but he's not going to show up. And he is eventually going to show up, but he's not going to reveal himself to the world as, hi, I'm Lucifer, the devil and Satan. Come bow down and worship me. He knows he's not going to receive worship that way. So how does he do it? He does it by what's called worship by representation. He deceives the world. He finds him a front man. In this case, this antichrist religious political system, the papal system. He sets up his front man. He props him up. He gives his power, his seat, and his authority to this system. And then we read in the scripture there in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, the latter part. What does it say? And all the world marveled and followed the beast. They even come to the point of worshiping the system because the devil deceives the world into believing that this system, his front man, his system, his, his papal leadership, his, his pope, this antichrist system, that it serves their best religious interests and their best civil interests so that all the world gives their allegiance, their respect, their, their, their uh, support to this system. And ultimately we see a contrast in the book of Revelation. And that's the point of this message. It's called those who follow the lamb, because when you get a glimpse and a picture of what's happening in Revelation 13, my friends, please don't miss this point. Bible prophecy predicts that the vast majority of the world in the last days will follow the beast. Mm. The vast majority of the world in the last days will worship the beast. And you might be sitting here tonight or today or wherever you are and saying, oh, you know, praise the Lord that I'm not going to worship that beast. My friends, let me tell you something. If you are not 100% grounded in Jesus Christ and you have not staked your faith and put your life in the hands of the Savior, then you know what? We're told that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from this planet day by day by day by day. And one day, if you're not sealed with the Holy Spirit, the devil's spirit is going to have full reign in your life. And then when that happens, what, where, where is your allegiance going to be then? I don't say that to scare. I simply bring about the reality of the fact that there are those. It's a very small minority according to scripture. It's a very small group. Jesus calls it the little flock. It's that remnant that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus, has the faith of Jesus as brought out very clearly by Pastor James. We see it there in Revelation chapter 14, verse four. It says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. That clear, where are you? It comes down to really two groups in the end. There's no middle ground. There's no third, you know, straddling the fence option. It comes down to you're either a sheep or a goat. You're either Either a part of the wheat or the tares. You're either a part of those who are obedient or those who are self-righteous and serve self. You're, you're a part of those who serve God with humility or you're a part of those who self-destruct with pride at the end of the day. But really it all comes down to this according to the book of Revelation. It comes down to either you worship the creator or you worship the created. That's true. Where is your allegiance? Are you among those who follow the lamb? Or will you be among those who ultimately end up thinking that they know more than the lamb, mm -hmm. that they know better than the lamb, that their works, their deeds, their belief, their faith is better than that of the lamb. Mm. My friends, it's not too late. Give your heart to Jesus now. Get into his word and prepare to be among those who follow the lamb wherever mm -hmm. he goes. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, and each one of you, the lessons tied together to do one thing, and that is what Revelation began with to lift up and point to Jesus Christ. This is his revelation, a revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have Thursday's lesson, Jesus, our only mediator. And I like each one of those words, Jesus, 
only mediator. Uh, God does not work the way we as humans might work. I'll give you three doors and you see if you can pick the right one. He gives us one way and he makes it abundantly clear. Uh, I take you back to Genesis 28 and all through the Old Testament, we find Jesus the only mediator. There's not a place we can look in the older Testament where we don't find Jesus as our only mediator. But in Genesis 28, Jacob, he knows his sin. He's on the run. He's running from his family, from a brother who he presumes is out to kill him because he has deceived him. He knows he's sinned against God and in torment of soul, realizing uh, what, what's happened with the, the distance now between him and God, he lays himself down to sleep, a fitful sleep. And God reveals to him through a dream, verse 12 says, then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. That's good news. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. This is not a ladder of his own making, not something of his own construction, not from his own goodness, not from his own worthiness, but God himself reveals this ladder. And what is this ladder? When Jesus comes there in John chapter one, speaking to Nathaniel who becomes his disciple, I believe it was Nathaniel, verse 51 of John one. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. That ladder that goes all the way up to heaven and rests right down on the earth, right where the sinner sleeps, that is Jesus himself and it's the only ladder. Mm -hmm. There's not another one. And this is the ladder upon which angels come down to earth. And so when we see an angel coming from heaven with the seal of God, the seal of God is not manufactured on earth. Mm -hmm. It comes from God's very presence and it comes through Jesus. We don't receive the seal of God through any other means. I want to read to you just one sentence here from Sons and Daughters of God, page 25. Uh, the reference actually comes from the youth's instructor, but it says this, Jesus, encircles man with his long human arm while with his divine arm he lays hold of omnipotence. That's a picture to keep in mind. All right. Jesus, who is as Hebrews 2, 17, therefore in all things he was made like his brother. He can hold his arm around us completely because he's one of us. And then Hebrews 4, 14, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, he alone holds us together. He is that mediator. And we don't need to think that Jesus is the mediator in the terms of he is uh, coming to God who is against us and he's going to mediate with God who is against us. No, he tells us in John 16, 27, the father himself loves you. And if you've seen me, you've seen the father. But in John 14, verse six, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. You don't come to the father by any other means except through me. And so what we do is we grab hold of the ladder right where we are. And we see that in the sanctuary too, as each of those items of furniture representing Jesus, they sat right down there on the soil, right down there in the sands and the dirt, right where sinners walk. You don't have to ascend into some high place to find him. Well, along with every truth, we know there comes a lie. Revelation 13, four and five, five and six, we've already heard this. And that word that you referenced, Ryan, blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Blasphemy is, is not an attack of physical violence. Blasphemy is words, it's claims, it's deceit, deceit that convinces, that calls attention away, that rewrites the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's no small thing. I wanna share with you what the Bible says about blasphemy. John 10, 32 and 33, mm -hmm. Jesus answered them, says many good works I've shown you for my father, for which of these do you stone me? And they said, not for any good works, but because you who are a man claim to be God, you who are low, establish yourself up high. Now Jesus was himself God. Matthew 12, verse 34 and 31, Jesus has just cast out a demon and the Pharisees, the religious leaders claim that it's by the power of Satan that he did that. So in verse 31, Jesus says, therefore I say to you, every sin, every blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven them. And so here what they've done is they've taken the power of God and they've attributed it to Satan. 
And so this is what happens. I remember in grade school, some situations like this, you give something to a, a friend of yours, go put this on the teacher's desk and he throws it in the trash can. Ha ha, it's opposite day. Well, things that are foolish and childish there, we cloak them in, in the language of religion. And uh, what we do through blasphemy is we turn things upside down. What, what, what belongs up high, God himself is thrown down to the earth and, and Satan in his way established up high. Mm. Confusion, wrong destination. Listen to Daniel 8, verse 11 and 12. This is that little horn power uh, once again in two phrases here. It says, the place of his sanctuary. This is God's sanctuary by the little horn power. The place of his sanctuary is cast down and he casts truth down to the ground. Mm. Right? This is taking what's high. God's hev Jesus' is heavenly sanctuary ministry and saying it's all on earth. It's all in the hands of people. It's all through your power. It's all through the power of priests and ministers here, not through the power of Jesus. Let's take 2 Thessalonians 2. We've heard this text many times, 3 and 4. The man of sin, the son of perdition, verse 4, who exalts himself above all that is called God and is worshipped. He sits in the temple of God and shows himself that he is God. He puts himself, here's, takes what's low and flip it around so it's on top. All right. Now we are to work with Jesus. We're to cooperate with him, but we do not take his mediatorial work. We bring people to Jesus like Andrew did and like others did. Now the Jews knew what this upside downness was all about. Acts 17, verse 5 and 6. Here's the Jews who they hear the gospel proclaimed and listen to what they say. They say, these men, this is Paul and Silas, have turned the world upside down. And so they hear the truth about God, about Jesus, about salvation through Jesus. And they say that is upside down. Mm -hmm. Being futile in their thoughts, Romans 1. And foolish, uh, their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Imagine you spent a day, uh, hard work, physical labor. And you come in and you are thirsty. Can I have a glass of water? And somebody puts a glass in your hand. And you drink back and it's a glass full of dust. Mm. Oh, giving the exact opposite of what you need. This is upside down. All right. Woe to those, Isaiah 520, who call evil good and good evil. Signs of blasphemy, claiming to forgive sins. The Jews knew this. Who can, who are you to speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Bowing down to humans. Anytime we bow to humans in the cult of worship where we elevate them to some human teacher, that we're going to follow them regardless of what they say, changing God's word, changing God's law, whether it be about the Sabbath or creation or death or sanctification. But let me, let me take this a little more personally, practically, we can turn things up, uh, upside down. Mm. Binge watching things late into the night, but we can't get up five minutes early to read the scriptures, mm. that's upside down. You have a thousand text conversations with friends throughout the world, but we can't pause to pray, that's upside down. Mm. Multiple streaming services, but too tired to, to go to church, and we never read the whole word of God, that's upside down. We tell somebody all about who it is who hurt us, but we never tell them about who it is who healed us. Wow. That's upside down. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. But it's not enough just to know about him. We got to come to him. Let me read this to you. See if I can make it all the way through. Our high calling, page 75. We ascend to heaven by climbing the ladder. The whole height of Christ's work, step by step, there must be a holding fast to Christ, a climbing up by the merits of Christ. To let go is to cease to climb, is to fall, is to perish. We are to mount by the mediator and all the while to keep hold on the mediator, ascending by successive steps, round above round, stretching the hand from one round to the next above. There's a fearful peril in relaxing our efforts in spiritual diligence for a moment, for we are hanging, as it were, between heaven and earth. We must keep the eye directed upward to God above the ladder. 
You look discouraged at the magnitude of the work before you. We point you to the ladder set up on earth, reaching to the city of God. Plant your feet on the ladder, forsake your sins, climb step by step and you will reach God above the ladder and the holy city of God. That ladder is Jesus Christ. Every bit of work that we put forward is only in the power of Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord. Thank God for Jesus, our only mediator. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much. I want to plant my feet mm -hmm. on the ladder of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel and Ryan and Pastor Johnny and Pastor James. What an incredible lesson. Yeah, I want to give you uh, opportunity for final thoughts. Powerful, beautiful, the faith of Jesus. If God loves us, if God believes in us, if God exercises faith toward us when we don't even believe in Him, if God gives us light, if God loves the world, if God doesn't condemn us, condemn us if God promises that He won't cast us out, if God gives us spiritual blessings and, and temporal blessings, if God pours out His, His blessings on the good and on the evil, the sunshine on, and rain on the just and on the unjust, how much more will He love us when we do actually believe in Him? Do not doubt. God's faith, God's love, the faith of Jesus toward you. Amen. 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 I want to encourage you to study God's Word. It is a light for our feet and a light to our path. God's Word, we need to read it, understand it, and live it. And God is willing to help you understand the Scriptures. And by His grace, we shall go through any conflict that comes our way, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Jesus' last words to Jerusalem as a nation before going to the cross. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Yeah. My friends, are we willing to follow Jesus? Because if we're willing to follow Jesus, then we will indeed follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Don't be among those who reject and fall into desolation, but those who receive and meet him in the clouds when he comes. Amen. I know Pastor Rafferty loves Romans 10, 17. No faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've heard the Word of God today. And I just invite you when the program closes, uh, open up that Word of God mm -hmm. and connect again with Jesus. Uh, invite the Holy Spirit to then lead you to put into practice by faith everything that you've heard, everything that Jesus has done for you. Amen. Thank you so much. I want to leave you with this verse. This is Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. We've been talking this entire quarter, the prophecies of the book of Revelation. Have you learned new truths to you? Have you learned something that you have not understood or maybe come to a deeper, fuller understanding of the prophecies in the book of Revelation? I appeal to you to study them and to make a choice to surrender your life to the God of the Bible. Join us next week. We're going to study the seal of God and mark of the beast part two.